any political issue, if you're a politician and, and your data looks like that, you're on to a winner by doing this deal. So this deal was completely, and, and, and where, where we advise banks and whatever about how to understand how to position for this GNU in, in the years ahead, a primary marker to watch is radicalization. If you want this GNU deal to break down, you need to radicalize public opinion and then you can break it. You might just actually make it as a country. Join us in supporting the Springboks when they take on the All Blacks at Ellis Park on the 31st of August 2024. We will be hosting exclusive hospitality at the Ellis Park Arena. Our hospitality includes pre-match analysis by international rugby players, lunch, drinks, Category A tickets inside the stadium so that you can enjoy the game right there. After the match, we're going to have live music, more food, more drinks, exclusive parking. What more could you want? If you want to join us and bring any size group, get more information below this video. Welcome to the State of the Nation, driven by Pace Car Rental. Here in the State of the Nation, we love to hear views, and we're very, very lucky to have one of our favorite analysts with us here today, a very popular voice in South Africa, and that is the one and only Dr. Franz Cronier. Franz, welcome back to the State of the Nation. Thanks for getting me in again. Yeah, the last time we spoke actually was in the very beginning of the year. Uh, we were talking about the forthcoming elections. It was still hot. Now we're sitting here freezing. The lights were still going off. But uh, yeah, a lot's changed since uh, January or February when we last spoke. We've had the election. Along the way, you called the election very, very well. You were involved with polls that were the closest to it. You took a, your organization that you're involved with, took a lot of flack for those polls. But uh, you came out uh, at the other end saying uh, a bit of those three wonderful words, told you so. Yeah, well, we never really said that. Yeah, well, I, I think you could have. Anyway, I'm saying uh, on your behalf. No, you know, just just on on yeah. We, I imagine we we met early in the year. Mm -hmm. Lights were off. Now they're on. Mm -hmm. Last week we even had to turn power stations off because yeah. we were producing too much electricity. And when we last met, the ANC governed South Africa, mm -hmm. and it now does so through a coalition with the DA. And sentiment on the country is very much more positive than it was then. So this is quite a long way to move for a society in a matter of six months. Yeah. And uh, France, we obviously had the election once again, as we said, you know, the ANC at that point, you, even even early in the year, I rewatched our discussion where you were saying quite clearly that you were adamant at because of that people people are starting to wonder whether the ANC couldn't have this great fight back towards the election and maybe get over 50% and rule in their own right. You were adamant they would stay below, and which turned out to be correct. And quite quickly afterwards, we understand and got to know the, 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 the constitution on this day to form a coalition pretty quickly, um, and we, which led to the government of national unity. But I want to just go back to before we get to discuss the government of national unity. The one thing that was very embryonic at that point was the Mkonto Wisizwe party, which sort of burst onto the scene in December. It looked like it had many hurdles to overcome in such a short space of time. But they got to the election, and not only did they get to the election, they did they, they did very, very well. What did you make of the MK performance? Of all this stuff, the, the election calls, the calls on ESKIM, it's not difficult to do. Yeah. If you have high quality information and high quality data, you will get it right. And then that's the only reason why we've been accurate. On Mr. Zuma, we knew that he was very popular. He had vast um, favorability scores in key ANC constituencies, and particularly so in KZN. And uh, that was always present. And I, I can recall you know, saying that to people, and I, as we sort of more well-heeled, would, would, would sort of exclaim that it's impossible, no one would ever vote for that man. And um, 
if you were in the sort of glass towers of of Santon, that that might be the view. But it's very similar to the what I experienced ahead of the American election 2016 in Washington, where where the joke later became there were people in Washington who didn't know that there were Trump supporters in America, and that was even on the it wasn't just on the Democrat side. So Mr. Zuma had this vast popularity, and we drilled into that, and we thought we began to understand what it was. It wasn't his policies. So don't make the mistake of thinking an MK vote was a radical vote and then lumping it together with the EFF. Zuma's strength arose from the perception of his persecution. The, 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 he, he played brilliantly the role of the victim. He was the great former liberation hero, which he had been. He'd been very brave. And he, had, he was flawed. You know, he, he had flaws. That works very well with the public. Like Hillary, um, uh, uh, Bill Clinton, after the Monica Lewinsky incident, made him much more kind of personable. Here's someone like, 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 yeah. like us. Yeah. So Zuma was flawed. That, that wasn't in dispute. He wasn't an angel. And he was being persecuted by the ANC, an ANC that had forgotten about its people and its heroes that had become distant and aloof, that had retreated into those very same towers. And it was the perception of his persecution that drove his votes. The critical inflection point was the decision to actually put him and MK into play. And that was a, a strategy to try and force a place at the coalition negotiating table. For the time being, that has not succeeded. But that was the motivation behind it. There was nothing surprising in his success, but it mustn't be misunderstood as a huge leap towards populism. It was a protest of, a, of, a, of, a, of an ANC constituency that felt, yeah, that's how we feel. They forgot about us. They've abandoned us. They've forgotten what, what we are here, what, what the party's here to do. And he's the personification of that. That resonates with me. So as my... Um, Uber driver at one point ahead of the election in, in Durban, I, you know, you broach political questions in Natal cautiously. And I said to him, well, who, who, who are you going to vote for? And as a youngster, and he said, oh, we're voting for the old man. And, and I said, why are you doing that? And he said, because he's fighting. And that was, and if you understand Natal and Natal politics, history of that, that is what was behind Zuma. So it was only a matter of whether the decision would be made to put him into play. And when that decision was taken, he he had then already the support uh, to be successful, which he ultimately was. And, and Jacob Zuma is a very competent person. It has been a mistake from the start to write him off as someone who does not belong in the rarefied air of, of affairs of state, of politics and economics. If you consider where he started his life, and how far he went, and the obstacles he had to overcome to get there. He's a remarkable individual, a chess player of great skill with a chess charity. Like Mr. Putin, he doesn't drink. It's a rooibos tea with the, with, with, with the lemons. And it's for, for people who, who had bothered to understand what Zuma was and, and his history and his abilities, his success in this election did not come as any great surprise. Yeah, he's a guy who made a career out of being a victim playing that card really well. And then I'd imagine his, uh, his campaign was really helped by the ANC's missteps in continuing the victim uh, narrative, keeping it very much alive. I mean, I wonder if they're going to give some money back to the ANC for all the publicity they gave. Yeah, they made, they made some serious mistakes on him. Uh, it's, it's quite similar to this attempt to prosecute Mr. Trump out of the American race. Mm. And, and you know, Mr. Trump once had to appear at the sheriff's office, I think, to be arrested or arraigned or something, and he had to have a mugshot. Yes. And if you go and Google that, maybe you guys put it up on screen. Yeah. It's an amazing image. Yeah. Uh, that, and, and, and he gets, in a sense, stronger the further he's pursued. And at the end of the, of the election, in the last month, we ran a tracker. So you poll every single day to follow opinion. And when the Constitutional Court said, God, remember exactly what, Mr. Zuma couldn't be the candidate or whatever it was, 
we saw his support lift as a consequence of that. And the same thing happened here. The further he was pursued, the more an issue was made of him, the more it fed the perception. Because remember, that is the that was his vote. It was the perception of his persecution. And the ANC made fatal missteps. And so did the media trying to aid the ANC in getting rid of Mr. Zuma and, 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 and whoever else was involved in that. They made fatal mistakes in not understanding what was driving the popularity behind it. However, MK without Mr. Zuma doesn't have legs. And there's, there is a view within the ANC that has a great degree of merit that a point will come when those MK votes flow back out of MK, some perhaps to the EFF, some perhaps to the IFP, but there's also a prospect of some of those votes returning to the ANC. And to be fair, we're starting to see it in some of the municipal by-elections. Yeah. If one lays over the provincial vote onto some of the areas in KZN that have had by-elections, we see quite re remarkably different voting patterns where MK got a massive percentage of the vote in certain areas, especially down in the south coast, and uh, those votes deserted MK when it came to by-elections. Um, just one calculation that may not have necessarily worked in the favor of MK is one imagines, especially if one sees how hard uh, Jacob Zuma has fought to remain tethered to the ANC and therefore bring it back so that we can reshape the ANC if that's his, uh, his mission. Uh, they didn't quite, I don't think they anticipated the, the ANC falling as far as they did. They they knew that they would lose. Yes. But the experience of it was very shocking. Hmm. And there were senior people who you would know and you might have had interaction with over the years and, and you could have shown them the numbers. And they might even have answered by telling you it is not possible yeah. that it's this low. And I think even even people who who answered in that way, I, I I suspect that they did know that this was this was the the inevitable consequence. Mm -hmm. uh, but but knowing it and actually accepting it was was a different thing. Yeah, and and I, I wouldn't say that it was the case that the result in practice took the ANC by surprise. It was the predictable and predicted result of the consequences of several years of, of governments. Yeah, well, I can back you up by saying I did an, an interview about two weeks ahead of the election with uh, Gwen Ramachopa, the Treasury General of the ANC, and uh, she would have passed the lie detector test in believing that they were going to get 55%. But anyway, that's a, a discussion for a different day. So roll forward. MK does really well. The real wild card, um, they uh, you know become the third biggest party. A uh, bit of slippage from the EFF that probably came at the hands of MK and a few other issues. But when it becomes clear that a government of national unity coalition has to be formed to govern South Africa, why aren't we sitting in a in a country run by the ANC and MK? And possibly the EFF as uh, you know, with sixty odd percent of the vote. Yeah. Why are we not sitting in that country? Yeah. I, I don't think the result was a surprise. Mm. I think it was already pretty much baked in way back in practice. E even to people who knew it would happen, but found it difficult to accept that this would be the result. There are a number of reasons for that. So no particular, in no particular order. One reason is that falling back on MK and the EFF would in a sense be an attempt to double down on the ANC's rural base. In this election, it got 5% of its votes from suburbs, 40% from townships, and 40% from traditional rural areas. But if you apply some mortality and immigration modeling to its rural base and nothing else changed, that base is shrinking to an extent that by the time of the 2029 election, ANC support would be six to eight percentage points down. 
just on the shrinkage of the rural books. It was, this was understood. This isn't a good option at all. This, this way you're going to become a rural part. Uh, later you'd be centered in northwest and Pumalanga and Limpopo, some strongholds in KZN, but only as long as Zuma's around. And, um, I mean, I, I remember the way it was worded at some points was you'd have your last policy conference in the marquee on the Botswana border as the dust <laughs> swirled around you and you spoke of when we governed in Southern Africa. And so a very important strategic decision had to be taken. Do we face up to the hard reality as the ANC that this is never going to work? That was step one. Step two, I think, was understanding that a sustainable coalition deal for SA can be only one deal. And that is a coalition between the established multi-generational middle class and the aspirant middle class. Now, the DA commands the established multi-generational middle class market completely and to a very great extent. Its future growth is limited by the growth of that market, and there are good reasons why it should just sit on that and, and take that to a coalition negotiation. And that's a very multiracial market. Now, in this election, we estimate that 43% of the DA's votes came from white voters. So the idea of the white party is ever less the case. The ANC, to survive politically and remain relevant, needed to command the aspirant middle class and the urban fringes. And to do that, it needed to join up with a partner that did not threaten that interest. Because the DA has been so stigmatized, it's very difficult for it to crack the black urban fringe vote. Because the middle classes have been through some load shedding and water shedding, the ANC can't crack again the established middle class vote. But the established and aspirational middle classes have the same interests. And so this is a wonderful deal because it's a deal between two partners that are not rivals. They can try and be rivals. The ANC is going to have a very hard time getting back into the established middle class. The DA will always have a hard time, or for a long time, have a hard time cracking the, the township vote. So what could be understood in the course of some of the thinking of, of what to do was that here is a deal between partners that do not threaten each other's core interests, and, but where the interests of their supporters are aligned. It is the only South African deal that can hold into the long term. And now just as we get a bit ahead of ourselves, if this GNU now holds, because life improves marginally over the next five years, it stands to become the predictable result of every South African election for the next generation, solidly tied in, and quite at odds with, with people who suggest that this GNU won't hold because the ANC and the DA will have disputes over ideology and policy and the like. I think if there is a danger in it, it's not that, it's the opposite, that they will become so deeply enmeshed with each other because they have so much in common that you will never pull them apart again and that they will, that they will stick together. So that was understood in, in the ANC camp. And on the flip side of that, the ANC camp understood, I think Mr. Fakil and Balula said it a few times in public now, that, that this idea of black solidarity is nonsense. These are not our allies. This reunification of the liberation movement is not a reunification of allies. It's a, it's a unification of adversaries. Mm. It'll be fatal for us to do this. So that was, that was the... The third thing is, is to understand the nature of the ANC as well. Southern Africa's liberation movements had common ideologies in sort of pursuit of a sort of national democratic revolution. But there were different philosophies behind how that revolution was executed. And the ANC sort of branch of it, of the philosophy, was very much in, in, in taking a lead from Lenin's advice that if you probe with a bayonet and you hit steel, you stop and you back off. And if you hit mush, you can pursue the revolution. 
And so in ANC strategy and tactics documents, and these things are publicly available. Any person can read them. They'll understand South Africa so much better than they do. The, 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 the advice, the law is you can advance the revolution when you meet with no resistance. But when you meet with resistance, you must stop and retreat. And this is how one survives. It's a very di- there's a very different philosophy that could have sat behind the revolutionary ideology to say you advance, and when you reach the critical point, you press beyond it, a sort of France Fanon kind of revolutionary Venezuela and Zimbabwe, and you, you burn the system to the ground, and out of the ashes a new Valhalla of whatever it is will arise. That might be the EFF. It is the EFF philosophy behind the ideology. But it's not the ANCs. So to say, because they broadly share some of the same ideas, they are naturally allies. They are not, because the philosophy behind the ANC ideology is survival into the long term. It's very clever, actually. And and, and they are therefore fundamentally different. And the expulsion of what the ANC saw as its ultra-leftists in the 1980s is still the thread that runs through the philosophy behind the ideology today. And so when it gets into trouble, when it faces firm resistance, the ANC will tend towards the pragmatic. Run out of electricity? Look at where we are today. Real reform. Railways fall apart? We're well on the way to fixing them. Lose an election? The, 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 predict, the, 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 the history, the, the, the deep thread of, 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 of how you execute the revolutionary ideology dictates you do a deal with the DA when you get to that point. So there was very little that happened here that was unpredictable. Mm. Um, and and I, there's a frustration of sorts that, that so many people who watch South Africa from abroad or live in the country are continually surprised by events. And, and, and that's not necessary if you do serious analysis and assessment of the data and of the information that informs the behavior of political actors. Yeah. Now... Um, France, before we move on to the actual government itself, uh, just staying with within the ANC, um, yeah, I sort of look at it as as saying what MK and EFF highlight to the ANC, in my mind, is the end of the broad church, yeah. right? And that is you've got your lunatic communist fringe, which, let's be fair, uh, Nelson Mandela, Tabo and Becky, these guys begged them to leave the public. They said, please go. If you don't, you don't like what we're doing, please go. They, so this isn't a new thing. Just finally, we took kicking uh, Julius Malema out of the party before they left. And then the tribalist side, this very deep rural side, as represented by Jacob Zuma, left. It, it sort of leaves this big rump in the middle, as as you say. Now, um, yeah, what, I, what you see a lot of in the media certainly in some of the statements, is this sort of idea threat doomsday scenario of the band getting back together again. I recently interviewed uh, Herman Mashaba, and I've got to say, uh, I think he'd rather die than go back to the DA. So sometimes when you see somebody leave, they become bitter sworn enemies. I don't see that band ever getting back together again. I wouldn't say never. Yeah, okay. get together. Never's a long time. I agree. No, never's a very. No, I wouldn't say never. Um, it can get back together if a few things now happen. Let's go back a few steps. The ANC comes to power in 1994. It inherits a fairly deep budget deficit. Fairly deep. By, by those standards, 30 years ago, uh, debt levels, national debt levels, uh, low growth rate. And 13 years later, it records the first sustained budget surpluses since the formation of the Union of South Africa. It's cut debt to GDP in half. Fixed investment to GDP is fighting its way up to emerging market norms. Never quite got there, but was well on its way, had it not been for 2008. And um, it's doubled the number of people in employment. And it's being pretty sensible. Its support, as a consequence, rose by six percentage points 
and it was more popular on the ballot, which is the ultimate poll, when Mbeki led it than had been the case when Mandela led it in South Africa to liberation. It, it was being sensible and pragmatic in, in the main, relative to what was to come. And it was growing its support base. After 2008, it starts toying with the radical populace, introduces the, firmly introduces the expropriation idea. I, I would, if, if, when I'm asked what, what caused the ANC's defeat, it was that it tried to ride the expropriation tiger after the, the when, when Mr. Ramaphosa and, and uh, others started to, well, it started to ride, the, it tried to, under Mr. Zuma, ride the expropriation tiger, and it tried to stay on that tiger, even after Mr. Ramaphosa had come to power. And that was just, you know, th- 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 that just made South Africa uninvestable. And then we had national health insurance, which compounded the effect, and we had some pretty mad stuff in the mining charter, and, and it's all, it's a compounding effect. And in the populist era, what was the, what was the consequence? What actually happened? What actually happened is they were decimated within just more than a decade in knocking their support down to 40%. Now, t- to our earlier point, this lesson is understood in serious parts of the ANC, that if, if you behave like a populist radical, you get absolutely hammered. If you govern in a sensible way to uplift the living standards of people, you do terribly well. That goes to a point we've long made that South Africa is an unradicalized society. Public opinion is very moderate and very sensible, despite what the mainstream legacy media tries to articulate and drive these these, these horribly dangerous narratives of these deep divisions, when in fact that's not true of the country. It's, It's a broadly united, pragmatic, sensible society. Remarkable, considering its history and its continuing inequalities. If you want this GNU deal to break down, you need to radicalize public opinion, and then you can break it. And if you're the EFF and MK, and you've now had a had a go at power, or you could have been the coalition partner, you you would have introduced a different philosophy behind the ideology, we'd be in real trouble now. If you're sitting on those the isolated, you've lost art, you but bit sore about this, if you want to get back to power, and I assure you these people understand this very well, because they're very good at these things. And they're watching the podcast. Yeah, well, I hope so. But they also know this. They don't need to yeah. watch the podcast. They, they're very good at what they do. They, they, just on a professional level, you, you treat them with great respect because they know what they're doing. What you do is you radicalize public opinion, and that's pretty straightforward. The national unemployment rate is 30-something percent at the moment, low 30s. The world's unemployment rate is about 5%. So this is an insane number. It's a, it is remarkable that public opinion is not radicalized, despite this level of exclusion. Amongst people under the age of 24, the unemployment rate is double that. It's approaching 70%. Mm. The labor market absorption rate, which is what share of young people again, under 24s, people who should be in employment, is, is 30%. The, the, the rest are out. It is... It is very easy. There is a very clear route back to power for the radical populists. And it goes like this. Hope that this young GNU does not improve material living standards markedly in its early years. Because the ANC did that. It doubled the number of people with jobs. Jobless growth is a nonsense. It never happened in South Africa. There is no such thing. In Berkey, doubled the number of people in employment. The biggest lie, yeah. The mainstream media told you in those years, I was there, we are suffering from jobless growth. Crap. It never happened. Yeah. Service delivery did not fail under the ANC initially. When the ANC came to power, 49% of families went to bed without electricity. Just more than a decade later, that was under 20%. There are no post-2008 
Second World War emerging markets that can beat on a macro level the state-led delivery efforts of the ANC first decade after 94. If you now want to break the GNU, you hope that it does not do, it, it can't replicate what the ANC did. It, it was The ANC just simply did far too well yep. initially. But it could do a little bit of that, and that might be enough. So you hope it fails on living standards. You then drive through the mainstream media deep narratives of terrible socio-economic and racial division to poison public opinion. And then you hope to, when the ANC next needs to elect a leader, and I don't know what they'll do, put someone in place who is not a champion of this GNU. And if you line those three little ducks up, one after the other, let this GNU f fail economically early on, radicalize public opinion, that's probably the biggest failure of South Africa's radical left, is they never radicalized public opinion enough to take power. Do that next, and then get the right guy in at the top. Then it's a ANC, MK, EFF coalition. It will be difficult to line those three ducks up, but that is all that you need to do. <laughs> and then where we are in 2029 is as far away from today as today is from where we were in the in the in the election of 2019. Yep. So do you do you see um, some of the scandals emerging around schools, which is always a very emotive topic, you know, racial things, and suddenly it comes in a batch. Yep. Do you see that as part of a orchestrated campaign to start that social division? Absolutely. It is exactly that. Do not think these things are organic. Yeah. There are explicit strategies to poison public opinion and de drive deep divisions in society because it is well understood that one of the reasons this deal has happened, as it is now, and we're fortunate that it is, is because public opinion in South Africa was moderate and open to it. Before the election, we tested this. The, the statement, I think, was um, there are good people in the uh, some good people in the ANC and some good people in the DA. And, if, and, and they have some good policies. And if they could come together and work together, that would be the best thing for South Africa. And strong majorities of black and white voters agreed that that would be the best thing for the country. And if you've got, I mean, strong majorities, you, you're approaching 60%. And if, if those are the numbers, about, only about a third was opposed, two thirds in favor, one third opposed. Any political issue, if you're a politician and, and your data looks like that, you're on to a winner by doing this deal. So this deal was completely, and, and, and where, where we advise banks and whatever about how to understand, how to position for this GNU in, in the years ahead, a primary marker to watch is radicalization of opinion. And um, that that is probably the watershed now. Pull off radicalization, you can break this GNU. Mm. Fail at radicalization, the GNU probably holds and becomes the predictable result of every future election. Because they've probably got one of those legs in place in Paul Mashatile, who seems to be one of those guys that would be more comfortable in an arrangement with the radical side than the current side. It looks, if one goes on his track record. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass on that one for now. Okay. Um, so uh, they, we, we enter into the GNU, and uh, um, yeah, this was obviously seeing Cyril Ramaphosa at his best, chairman of the board, you know, um, putting together deals, uh, uh, not doing too much himself, uh, you know, smiling a lot. Um, and he is, you know, sitting on his throne and appointing things, but they couldn't help but to to sort of get their last pint of blood out of their coalition partners, especially the DA. Um, you know, you bloat the cabinet, you agree to six positions on the understanding that the cabinet would be smaller and then you increase the size of the cabinet. You initially agree to trade and industry and then you take it away. 
Uh, do you think this is just sort of negotiating tactics, feeling very clever at the start? There was a bit of politics, but overall I thought that both sides did very well. Um, Mr. Ramaphosa's nature became a real asset. Hmm. Yeah, you know, he's not Lee Kuan Yew or a park in Korea or Deng in China. Hasn't, to the chagrin of some ANC supporters, been the most decisive man. But but finding the middle ground became a very useful skill to have, and he certainly did that. It was very difficult for ANC people to do this deal, and they had a choice. Remember, they had a choice, and and it was a choice. You could go with the EFF and MK. That was perfectly possible. And all the consequences that would attach to it, and they didn't do it, and that that's remarkable and very hard for them. On the on the DA side, I thought John Stiernosen was absolutely spectacular in how he handled his side of 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 the talks and negotiations. It would have been very tempting. There would have been some pressure for grandstanding, for demands. We'll join. We'll sort of, you know, you you can beg us. Maybe we'll come in. Absolutely, absolutely. Fantastic and and statesmanlike and serious and how it was done, and that's that's how it needed to be done. And had there been grandstanding from either side, and had there not been a willingness to give, then it wouldn't have worked. And and what what I mean, the, or what I observed of it was that both sides actually put the interests of the country first. Um, yeah, I say to some of my, you know, I've got American sort of interests and and the like and think a lot about America and what's going to happen in November and spend some time there. But you can say to your American friends that, you know, we had an election and the loser accepted the result and immediately. <laughs> like, and then no one, no one stormed the union buildings afterwards. Yeah. And then, and this is the real one, a bipartisan deal was struck. That is, that this is now, on, on that score, a very good place to be. Yeah. Um, look around politics of the Western world, how deeply divided it is. We are less divided than a lot of Western democracies on, on issues. We spoke the other day a bit about this and went into the question of culture, and where culture is the values and belief systems that, that a group of people might, might hold dear to them. South Africa has far more common ground on culture than people understand across lines of history and race and socioeconomic status where the, the sort of cultural values of America's deep divide are so alien and at odds with each other that you cannot easily, you cannot do that bipartisan deal in the present. South Africa is a lot, as a liberal democracy, is a lot less divided than the world's should be leading liberal democracies. And when it's a value-based proposition, belief, whatever, I, I mean, I chair one of the country's polling groups, I, you know, we do, we do know the stuff. There is enormous cultural common ground across the country's historical divides, more so than people would understand. And, and that was something that, that both um, Mr. Ramaphosa and Mr. Stiernosen Yeah were able to take advantage of, and um, they could not have done better than they did. I okay, so enormous credit from, from people for, for this deal. So to date, um, there's sort of two features that jump out at me. One is uh, obviously the um, cabinet ministers from other parties that have come into it, DA, um, Freedom Front Plus, etc., the Patriotic Alliance, there's almost been a race for them to almost make a mark and show their presence. You know, we saw Gaten McKenzie releasing uh, names that the ANC wouldn't release of which sweetheart deals they gave artists during COVID. We saw Dean McPherson uncover something which had been lying on the desk of the Minister of Public Works for, for years of a massive theft. Um, do you do you think that this is just the way it's going to start, or do you think that there's there's a potentially a clash here, of a, a serious potential clash of an organisation where you're used to doing your job versus organisation where you're not used to doing your job? Look, I continue to hold the view that, which I think is obvious, that had South Africa ever been 
at any point in its long history been a society where people chose their leaders. We would never have ended up in a position where one party had 60% of the vote and another had, you know, 20 and, and so on. We, we, it, it's the, that, that ANC dominance was, was simply a hangover of our apartheid past. And when the moment was reached, as it always would be, where um, living memory experience of the past faded in favor of contemporary issues, the ANC's dominance would, would fracture. And being a completely free and open society, which is what we are, um, means that over time, the politics will come to reflect the society. That had never happened because we, we, were, we, we weren't run in a free way. And our society is not structured into a group of 60% and then a 20% group and then a, another group. It's far more, more, more fractured than that. And in, in that respect, the presence of smaller actors in the government and the cabinet, if, if you go along with this, not, not everyone I talk to does, I think there's merit to it, then the presence of smaller actors in the cabinet is very positive because it is... It is a nod to the reality of the fracturing of the politics into a parties that represent South Africa's great diversity. And um, yeah, so so again, I mean, this this cabinet and the hearts being put together, I think has been and, and there are arguments on the other side, and I'm I'm alive to those. There was a view that, you know, perhaps it 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 it. It, it, I wouldn't attach this view to the DA, but, but the, perhaps there was a view somewhere that if the DA would stay out, put the ANC and EFF together by default, they would cannibalize each other and yeah. come 2029. That, that, that view had, had some merit. Mm. There was a view that it's very dangerous for the DA to go into government because when you're in government, you are no longer the opposition. Mm. And the opposition has now been ceded to uh, the radical populists. And, and I've warned what could happen. And that view had a lot of merit. And, and all these views did. And, and there was a, a point where there was a, some people were sitting in a meeting and were going to and fro on these things. And eventually the point was, was, was put to them, you know, gentlemen, because men there, whatever decision is now taken, in 20 years' time people will look back at it and say, what were those mad people thinking 20 years ago when they made such a stupid choice? Couldn't they see what the implications would be? And that regardless how you cut it up now, the, the, you must in some sense think that maybe that's how it's going to be judged. But you were in that moment, you had to take a decision. And I think a, absolutely the best decision so now, was taken. So we get the spirit that it was taken and it's uh, it it feels like the right decision uh, country seems to have settled down um uh, and we almost seem like we're on the, the 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 threshold of getting back to business uh except for one thing and that is kaoting we've made quite a big deal of it i've made quite a big deal of it in state of the nation where kaoting the memo clearly didn't reach fanyaza lusufi that there's a, we're in a new stage here, what do you make of uh, the pushback from uh, the Gauteng ANC? I think it's a rebel province. It was that prior to the election. It doesn't always take instruction from head office. Head office. I think it's a nucleus of an effort to deliver a leader who would succeed Mr. Ramaphosa and break down the GNU and replace it with an ANC EFF, perhaps MK coalition. That's what's happening at Gauteng. And how do you see this playing out? Because obviously we do know that uh, Cyril Ramaphosa's style is not to come in and stamp it out. He's going to do the slow poison or nothing. I'm not sure um, how it will play out in Gauteng. Um, for, for the Gauteng strategy to succeed, you, you need the deeper success of radicalization of opinion. Um, so I'd, I'd continue. To, I mean, that's one thing we do know. We can measure it. We know how it's going. You can counter it if you wish to. Um, but I do not know how 
the Gauteng effort will play out when the ANC in two years' time, two and a bit, sit down to elect their next leader. So that's the first, well, that's, it's a first major horizon that this GNU is going to have to survive. But in the meantime, we must enjoy the moment. We've got about the best outcome that, uh, that the country could get. Well, it's, it's a very good outcome. And it, it, on balance, if you ask me, on balance, for what we can see, it will probably hold. Because the public supports it. It works structurally. The aspirant and the established middle classes together. Global economic outlook is largely, posit- is largely positive. Uh, and, and, and electricity is not now, if, if, the, if the ANC ministers, a grateful day there on energy policy, not, if their coal refurbishment strategy, which is the reason the lights are off, not more solar power, solar helped, but, but it's coal, if they are allowed to continue, and our major trade partners in Brussels and the US do not try and sabotage the GNU by telling us to turn off the coal stations at the moment that we might just actually make it as a country. And European and American energy policy towards Southern Africa is now a major threat to the survival of the GNU itself. It's an absurd situation. They are not giving us the break on this that we need to have. If the energy thing holds, then um, concurrent with our political position, we will have the prospect into the late 2020s and into the 2030s to ratchet up the growth rate so that through the 2030s, we can quite realistically again aspire to average the growth rates of the world's leading emerging markets. And if we do that through the now from here, pull, so hold now, make this thing work, um, do 2%, 2.5% growth out through the term of this GNU. That's probably enough to have it return to power. From there, move a bit more boldly, get the growth rate up to approach 4 and then 5%. Hold that there for 15 or 20 years, and we'll take our 30% unemployment rate down to 10%, and we will be a very successful society. Well, ladies and gentlemen, let's hope that uh, Franz Cournier is right on this. He's been right on so many things leading up to this moment. It's in our hands. We've got the government uh, that at the moment is probably the best one we could get. We can only hope that uh, that South Africa um, takes uh, makes the necessary economic breakthroughs that we need to make and that the country keeps on growing. Thank you so much for joining us today on the State of the Nation. Remember, support Pace Car Rental to France Cronier. France, thank you so much for joining us. Always a pleasure. Thank Lovely you. to hear from you. We'll see you again on the State of the Nation. <laughs>